So, of course, guys, welcome on in. Uh, we are here with Chimona. I hope I said that correct because I was like, is it Chimona? He, he, like the Michael Jackson sort of thing. Like Shimona. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. <laughs> yes, of course, we are here today. We're doing a wonderful sort of uh, interview with Chimona about uh, level design and many other sort of questions will be answered, especially from the community. But of course, for a lot of people that do not know you, obviously, um, tell us who you are and what you do. I'm uh, Sammy Chimonahihi Ayubi, and um, I'm uh, the founder of the Eagle One development team, which is a group of Source 2 developers that have been developing for the engine, uh, starting with Half-Life Alex. <clears throat> I primarily do the uh, level designs for uh, what a lot of the team produces. We have uh, several other level designers as well, but when it comes down to uh, producing the majority of our sandbox content, I've been uh, making the majority of the maps released under the Eagle One development team brand. Now, in terms of of kind of just developing and doing a lot of this in terms of level design. How long have you been doing level designing for and why did you get into it mostly? I uh, I actually originally started back on Unreal Engine way back uh, a couple of decades ago um, and uh, spent a couple of years on that. Uh, then uh, ended up uh, focusing on school and uh, totally dropping it until actually uh, COVID. And uh, during COVID, uh, while we're all sitting inside, I decided to go ahead and uh, take a look back at level design. And uh, Half-Life Alex had just come out, and uh, that game was uh, the, probably the one of the top three video game experiences I ever had. And uh, within a week of uh, playing the game, the tools were officially released. And so that just coincided with um, having extra time uh, to dabble into it. So ever since then, um, getting into Hammer 2 uh, was a passion of mine. And uh, that's where my level design uh, really took off uh, during COVID. Now, in terms of the the one specific map, I think the first map I properly seen by you was the uh, Ophelia Research Bay that was released on Sandbox. And specifically, I have a couple of questions in regards to this map in general. Yeah. What was the, the entire purpose for a lot of people that don't know uh, the purpose of this map and what it's used for? within sandbox uh, the map was created for a uh, gameplay uh sorry game mode uh boomer which was made by the face punch team and that game mode was uh, a lot like quake 3 and unreal tournament and so that really brought back uh for me when i started to design the type of uh, game style that i loved and fell in love with the first person shooter style of the late 90s early 2000s and uh, i ended up going back and uh, playing some of the unreal tournament quake 3 maps and uh, decided with this game mode, I'd love to make something that was using the Source 2 engine. And uh, I had just uh, <clears throat> come off of making a, a map that was uh, a sci-fi themed map um, that was based off of just nothing but hammer meshes and dev textures. And I wanted to, with the assets that uh, our team had and were creating at the time, I, I wanted to put together something for uh, Source 2 engine, the boomer game mode, that I felt like was a good representation of uh, what the Source 2 engine can bring you. Yeah, and, and especially from the way that it's presented and, and the design and everything, like it honestly blew me away because when I first seen it, I was like, wait, this is a map that was made in the Source 2 engine for Sandbox? So I was just instantly hooked and I was like, oh, this is sick. So in terms of um, obviously, I'm, I'm pretty sure you've probably seen it at one point. One of the the, the first uh, map showcase video that I did, that was one of the levels. And I was like, this map is just like blows my mind because the amount of detail and especially just everything that was put in it seems like pretty much like a professional level design for a game. That's like a triple A game, in other words. And you wouldn't really see that as much. But the fact is you're you're kind of pushing that boundary to show people, hey, like this is what the source to um, kind of between that and then the hammer to engine and tools can bring you. It's just really it's it's there. It's like you can put what you want and you can push it to that that limit or that point in general. How long did this kind of take you to create the map as you know, as it is now? Yeah, um, from start to finish the map, um, I looked back well, I was in development for about five weeks. Um, but <clears throat> this map was really the accumulation of me taking um, you know, the last two years uh, designing uh, a lot of different levels and finding out what works and what doesn't work and beginning to really streamline a workflow that was uh, effective in terms of getting out tests and then being able to go through the blockouts, going through the art pass, going through the lighting pass. 
Um, I've been very fortunate that um, on my team, I've had a lot of feedback from the developers in Eagle One uh, that uh, helped us streamline really exactly what it takes to design a level uh, that works well with the Source 2 flow and the way that we're able to integrate custom models, custom assets, uh, whether it's music or, or, or the textures or the models, um, to be able to produce something that is representative of uh, not just me, but really a group of people who specialize in different parts of the Source 2 engine. Um, and for me, the, the, the map itself and testing it, um, you can actually uh, play the block out versions of Ophelia. I was very um, grateful that the community, when I created a block out of Ophelia with nothing but dev textures, uh, jumped on and play tested it for a week or so. And I got a lot of feedback um, from the community about what they thought was good with the map, what they thought wasn't. Um, we looked at it from a more competitive angle in terms of having multiple tiers, multiple levels, um, being able to have the layout with the weapons and where they're located. Um, it, it really did bring me back to uh, how the Quake 3 and Unreal Tournament game style was when uh, we had a, a lot of people testing it out at once. And, and so these those original blockout maps, I actually jumped on the other day and, and, and played it. It's a, a great way to see the progress of how the level is designed uh, to where it gets to. Um, but uh, fortunately, um, what helps is uh, understanding uh, how Hammer is able to take uh, level design that can seem really complex and if you simplify the approach and you use the tools that Hammer has, um, you know, I, I ended up saving a lot of time by making half the level and then just simply mirroring it over. Um, and so what you end up seeing is uh, it, it looks like it's an extremely large arena, but by saving some time during the design process with the workflow that we were able to uh, figure out over the last couple of years, um, it, it didn't take nearly as long as it might have um, had someone not had quite the uh, the team behind them or the experience to be able to put it together. So, um, you know, fortunately, um, I've been uh, able to use the uh, tools that uh, FacePunch has uh, put out with the updates in Hammer itself. Uh, some of the uh, map uh, geometry that was created in there is the result of uh, the, uh, for example, the bevel update that FacePunch gave Hammer. Uh, Hammer, which is not found in any of the other versions. So uh, another good question that I wanted to ask, and probably many people that would want to ask is, why did you go with the underwater sort of space uh, research facility theme for this map? Like what, what made you want to kind of choose that one compared to like anything else you could really choose from? Interesting enough, the uh, design started off as um, I was inspired by uh, a golden eye level um, that was... Uh, that that actually kind of gave me the skeleton for it. So originally, I, I knew it'd be some sort of uh, uh, industrial or, or base operations, but uh, the underwater theme came about from actually looking at the color palette that I've used in my previous maps. And I had never used the color green as a primary color for how my other maps uh, were designed. And so for this, uh, it became a challenge um, using the color green and uh, an underwater environment. Um, I wanted to also kind of push the um, abilities of the Source 2 engine and its ability to, to use its viz computing to uh, optimize a map. So that way we can have these what looks like endless uh, sky boxes when you look outside the map, uh, being able to see what uh, is, I'm hoping was a convincing uh, environment. Uh, that to me was another challenge since I'd never done anything in the water as well. Uh, so that ended up being a great combination of uh, never doing anything underwater and never using the color green and uh, I ended up taking some time uh, watching a couple of movies that were uh, that were uh, uh, surrounded in uh, that was sorry I'm uh, not surrounded but that was in these sorts of environments uh, watching YouTube videos of a bunch of different artists depictions of what underwater bases would look like I was very um, yeah I, I went around and picked out a lot of different inspirations for the design that ended up being the final product uh, but that was a primary driving force was that c color uh, being green as a primary color rather than um, what uh, was dominated uh, with other colors such as blue or orange. Um, I wanted to try to switch it up a little bit. 
Yeah. And, and I think what's really interesting is, especially with the environment and looking through, I had to do like maybe a, a couple of takes to look at the outside of it and just kind of see like the creatures that are just like floating in, like the you know, the school of fish and everything. It makes it properly feel like it is really underwater with at least all the aquatic life and, and even creatures you want to even normally really even see. You're just like, what is that? But you just keep looking and just, you know, paying attention to it before, you know, you end up getting shot or something like that. If you're, if you're yeah, playing I Boomer. Was, I was fortunate uh, that uh, Kabubu was uh, the person in charge of making both the particle systems and the models and the designs for those. And um, I just simply asked him, hey, um, can you come up with uh, some fish and some monsters? And uh, he did all the animations and implementations. Uh, so it makes it really easy um, to have someone of his caliber uh, within a, a day. I mean, I think it took a 24 hour turnaround. And uh, all the outside stuff that you see was implemented and uh, fine-tuned. Um, and uh, just being able to uh, use the effects, um, I, it's, it's, I think maybe the latest update broke it because uh, dynamic fog isn't quite what it used to be. But um, at one point in one, uh, the, the fish that were swimming around and the shadows that were being cast into the um, underground base had uh, the dynamic light rays, the changing shape. And um, I felt like that was... Um, that was really impressive of what the engine is capable of doing. So I wish I wish that was fixed because I don't think it does it anymore. But that to me was also a big bonus of having that sort of environment. In terms of the levels that you've designed, um, what is the most sort of complicated level that you've designed by far, you would say, in your opinion? Um, the most complicated level, I have um, a level that uh, was a mini golf level, a chateau, uh, that uh, ended up taking place on floating islands, um, sort of inspired by uh, watching my my six-year-old play uh, Super Mario and uh, th having these floating castles in the sky um, around a, uh, a mini golf theme that has now been, I believe you can do it in VR. So VR mini golf. Um, to me, I wanted to, to make an environment that was, um, that required a lot of, um, a, a lot of thinking when it came to how I would optimize the map as best as I could since it was a rather large open map. And so uh, this map itself does uh, push the limits of uh, how big you can actually create a map within Source 2 for now. The, the limits of the uh, maps are constricted to what Hammer is able to show you on the grid. Um, and so uh, Face Punch, I know, has said that they want to be able to expand and make it so that these maps can be bigger. Um, but the reason why Chateau was uh, technically one of the most complicated ones uh, did come down to uh, just having to be creative with uh, what we call viz blockers. And that's basically obstructing the view so that the player uh, isn't seeing what's rendered behind it. Um, and uh, being creative with this so that way you can have what seems like an open environment yet still really trick the player when in reality they're in an enclosed space. Um, that was what the challenge was for that map. Um, and um, we do, uh, there is another map, um, actually, now that I think about it, in terms of uh, uh, creative design, uh, I think uh, input, I think, went into our Grand Prix map, um, Neo Tokyo, which um, uh, actually takes up the entirety of the Hammer 2 grid itself. So it, it, you, you're driving in a car, and I think we just updated Grand Prix today, so it should be working. Uh, I believe Odessi went ahead and updated the, the code. Um, so that map itself is it's a racing map. Um, we do have people who uh, competed for a world record. I had a, a little bit of a prize for whoever could come up with that. We were... Um, uh, we had the uh, first um, system in Face Punch when we released Grand Prix where you could see your world record. So people were constantly um, racing. And then you, you could go to a website and it even tell you where you were ranked in terms of the, the lap times. Um, and so designing that map, um, that was a challenge because it, you're, you're making the player feel like they're driving around an island. And the entire time the player feels like they're going through in and out uh, different tunnels, um, up and down hills. Um, when in reality, the map was designed to essentially hide everything as much as possible when the player couldn't see it, um, which required me to completely uh, do the entire map manually. Um, and essentially what that means is normally you tell the, 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 the game engine, hey, you can figure out what the player can and can't see. Um, and most people end up doing that. Um, but optimizing it and uh, breaking it down required me to basically tell the engine, don't worry about it. I'll take care of the viz. I'll tell you what you need to draw and what you don't need to draw. 
Um, and that that was in itself uh, probably the most tedious process to squeeze every frame that we could out of it um, since uh, a big part of the design of our maps is to make sure they're playable. And um, that's been a, that's been really, I think, the biggest challenge uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, I think it's been very interesting because uh, I know that, especially even though it's completely different, I know that for VR within Sandbox, I know they have like a process when it comes to like the eyes and specifically where you're looking. It will go and render mm-hmm. that in full you know, resolution compared to around the areas that you're not focusing on, which will allow more performance, more enhancement to like you just playing in a lot more just just smooth gameplay just in general. It is. It's um and that's I think where our uh developing for Half Life Alex before Sandbox came in handy because the whole game was in VR and you had to achieve a ninety frames per second uh constant uh frame rate. You didn't want any dips, you didn't want any dives. And so developing for that really forced everyone on the team to have to squeeze every frame that we could out of that knowing the techniques of the the trade um and uh you know going to sandbox and uh, taking that with us into that vr environment is going to be essential to be able to make a game where it runs at a smooth frame rate otherwise yeah you end up with a lot of people who uh, have that motion sickness that won't let them play more than 30 minutes of your game so it is going to be a factor um but you know fortunately uh, half-life alex provided us those opportunities uh going back over to the the chateau map which actually is very funny because i had a question relating to that um in terms in general, uh, just kind of describing a bit more of the map and possibly I'm going to show pictures and whatnot within the video. Uh, it's really well done, honestly. Like I have to give you like huge kudos for this because I looked at it and I was like, oh, dude, I love mini golf. I love like the, the sort of golf at your fun type game. So the fact that there even was this is like the first time I even acknowledged that there was even a mini golf game mode. And I guess I just might not have been looking hard enough. But just seeing that, I was like, oh, dude, this is awesome. Like, I'm so glad that there's mini golf. But then you have maps that are like this, like uh, Chateau, which are just well, again, well designed, well thought out, incredibly detailed. And again, Thank push you. the limits of of just uh, hammer two tools are and in general and just putting that within source two and showing people again, this is another awesome map. You can do this and just depending on what it is, you can possibly make it. And it's a it's a possibility that's right there yeah Yeah, no i agree i think that i think really the the beauty of this engine is that um from one map to another you can go from having a very cartoony kid style approach um you know uh, essentially having like what can appear to be a cel-shaded type game to having an extremely realistic, gritty, dark uh, environment where uh, the 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 person in charge of making the map and the whoever is in, going through and doing the environment design um, that it just simply comes down to what you want to make. And so I I, have, I love seeing everything that ranges from the the realistic approach with guns to like the more Unreal Tournament Quake Three style with Boomer. Um, then you have uh, fighting games. They just made, released a 2d fighting game um in the last uh yeah jam that face punch had so uh the ability to make any map for any style is out there um and, and hammer's approach compared to other engines um, like the unreal engine really makes you feel like a level designer instead of uh what seems like with other engines just an asset placer um and, and the approach that hammer 2 has and the ability for us to create tools and, and uh, within hammer uh, that uh the coders are coming up with for example they they, they have a you can code a tool that makes spiral staircases automatically um and, and so these are the types of things that we never had before uh, that to me is really exemplary of how you know this is an engine that you can make anything with 2d games 3d games vr games um, you just have to have, um, you know, you just have to have the, the patience to learn it. Um, and one of the most interesting games that, um, it, you know, because you bring up the VR game there. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to know. Maybe I'll call it the golden age of uh, Sandbox. But there was a time about a year into the release of uh, the dev um, uh, of the dev preview where you had a ton of games that were being pushed out that unfortunately, because of the last few pain days, haven't been updated. And so they kind of just ended up getting buried over all these other new ones that came out and um yeah the quality of those games that were released during that time um were, were definitely uh i would say eye-opening um so uh just being able to hear you say for example you know vr golf um yeah there, there's definitely uh more um 
than I think is on the surface, which makes it, uh, you know, a, a kind of a treasure box that Sandbox has to provide for us. There's so many like the small little diamonds out there. So that's what I love about it. This is more of a, a technical question in relation to, again, you talking about Hammer. Uh, and I know a lot mm-hmm. of people, especially people that may not know or they have knowledge from Hammer One, specifically within modding maps within Gary's Mod or anything like that. And they look at Sandbox and they're like, I love this. I want to try this out. But uh, the question in general is, how much of a difference between Hammer 1 and 2 is when developing maps for Sandbox compared to Gary's Mod and, and what can you kind of describe? Funny, I, I I learned Hammer 2 before Hammer 1. So, you know, and technically I guess it's Hammer 5 or Hammer 6, depending on where you want to look at. But Hammer 4 Source 2, and we'll just call it Hammer 2, <laughs> um, was what I learned. And then I went backwards when I, word, when I heard about everyone talking about Hammer, the original one, being such a pain to work with compared to Hammer 2. Um, I, I think I dabbled one day in uh, Hammer 1 trying to make a map that I would think takes like five minutes in Hammer 2. and ended up taking so long because of the approach that Hammer 1 has compared to Hammer 2. And it really comes down to um, the best way to say this is like in, in Hammer 1, you're, you're forced to use essentially blocks to build everything. And so, you know, if you build a room that only the players inside, it's a six sided room, you'd actually have to build 36 faces to make that six sided room in Hammer 1. You'd have to make a, a box on the bottom, on the left, right, up, and, and on the sides. As opposed to Hammer 2, where it's a mesh-based approach. So instead of having to to have 36 faces to make up a small little room, you just have six faces because you're just drawing the mesh or pulling or extruding the mesh, almost like you would in a 3D modeling program like Blender. And uh, for a lot of people who come from a modeling background, when they jump into Hammer, they find its ease of use to be a snap, uh, since the approach is is based on you know uh, being able to grab edges and extrude faces and pull it and push it, um, and, and so that has uh, really changed ex- how you approach the map uh, design, uh, just simply because of how you s- place down the the br- uh, the brush versus the mesh from Hammer One to Hammer Two, and, I, and that kind of gives you like a bit more perspective because you know since it it is a bit more of a bigger update within source 2 obviously the tools have to get updated unless they're you know if it isn't broken then you know don't fix it sort of thing but at least it's it's a lot more easier for people to understand that it can translate especially like you mentioned from blender into this because it's a as you mentioned it's a mesh based sort of ordeal yeah yeah and i know i know the lighting also um and i know source 2 lighting is obviously better than source 1 but within the tool (laughs) Within the tool, within the tools of Hammer, though, being able to preview the lighting and see how it's going to be baked in, and all of those different tools makes Hammer Two so much better. I know from what Hammer One could be a lot of uh, tedious guesswork goes into uh, the process of making sure that the lighting is how you want it compared to what Hammer Two provides. So. Um, that's, that's another component that I know is a big difference between the two. We're going to get a bit more into some, uh, questions within the community. And also we're going to then move on from the community questions into, uh, things for the possible future that maybe you may mm-hmm. see, or you would like to see. So, uh, one of the first ones is, uh, I get this question asked a lot from the community and, um, mm-hmm. this is something again, relating to the size of maps, but, uh, for newcomers that are looking into sandbox coming from Gary's mod and they're wanting to play and create maps. How big can maps truly get on Sandbox? Because from what I remember, it's been a little bit more like mixed where some people are saying the the limit for maps has been removed compared to Gary's mod, but then things start Mm. to get really bad and like they start to break. I know with Source 2, what ends up happening is um, you can go beyond what is called the grid. And so Hammer 2 has this uh, 3D grid that they show you. I believe off the top of my head, I want to say it's 32,000 units by 32,000. I think think it ends up being like around, and those are in units, and one unit equals an inch so you can have a map that is within the grid that it allows you to build and um i'll get the specific number later on but once you reach that point certain parts of the map begin to break and uh within the map itself um i know that the lighting uh the way that it bakes the light maps will uh begin to get awkward past it 
Um, from what I've seen, cube maps uh, don't tend to work past the limit, um, but cube maps f haven't been working really since day one. That's like kind of the running, um, like when I, I would say like the running joke of the level design community in S Source 2 for Sandbox has been uh, cube maps, are they fixed yet? <laughs> it's been since day one a problem that we haven't been able to really resolve. But what ends up happening is the further and further you, away you go from the origin, um, zero, 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 uh, you just, the math behind uh, being able to have, I think they're called floating points, it just ends up being an issue. You just end up having too many decimal places the further away you go from zero for it. And then uh, you end up getting what looks like spaghettification. The models end up looking like they're going through a black hole. Um, but yeah, as far as the level goes, um, there has been, there have been attempts to have uh, it push out beyond what we can design in Hammer uh, with some of the more um, coded games. Um, I know that uh, uh, Kana from Face Punch had uh, designed kind of a, a Minecraft-like clone uh, in terms of how it would generate the world and how far you could go out. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I think the technical term was using uh, um, uh, uh, building it based off of these voxels. And so that, to me, I think is, from what I see, a possibility to push it beyond the grid that we have but as a level designer right now if we want to put something that we know is going to work that we know the lighting isn't going to be messed up and we know that players can actually traverse without having issues we are restricted to the 3d grid right now which does make it a li bit limiting in terms of the open area games that we can make um, there have been some um, there have been some workarounds that have been proposed such as well why don't you scale the player to half their size and then you can build you know bigger maps and uh, a the reason why that apparently isn't technically possible is the physics calculations that are involved with a player at half its size isn't going to really translate over by just simply making the map half its size. I guess it's going to, it, it really is uh, uh, something that does constrain us somewhat. Um, so uh, as of right now, if uh, we can get past that barrier, then you're going to begin to see a lot more of those large open games that a lot of people crave um, that, that other game engines like you unity are able to provide um you know for example uh, like rust is, is is something that currently wouldn't be possible because of that limitation but uh, they, i have heard you know face punch has mentioned uh that they want to be able to to change the approach uh to having that um and having big maps is something that they've con continued to say that they're gonna be looking into um but uh, the other thing that ends up stopping the engine from really being a uh, a great to develop these large maps for isn't just the size constraints of hammer uh, but also the way that it calculates visibility and um, the current way it calculates it makes it very difficult for large open maps where there's not what we call viz blockers to tell the engine hey don't draw behind this um, that's also something that's a little bit difficult until they change their approach so uh, but from what i know they, they keep saying that this is something in the work so hoping that they come up with a solution yeah I, i've noticed that uh, previously before I, I don't know who it was or what they mentioned i, I think i've seen it like long ago within uh, one of their dev blogs but they had a map and with Within that map, they were kind of like designing this sort of like almost MMO sort of styled game where they were trying to test the idea of how big and large the maps could go. And as you mentioned, like at least at some point, and I'm pretty sure that's, that's somewhere within their work pipeline of uh, trying to figure out on how they could implement this. Because honestly, in my opinion, that could be incredibly uh, beneficiary to the game itself to have as much variety as possible. And I know there might be limitations, but uh, for them to just be able to take out the time to, you know, focus on it, to develop it, to then push it out so that people are able to do that. I'm pretty sure it must be somewhere along the pipeline, if not, if, you know, in the future, if be. Yeah, I think it's I think they understand it'd be in their best interest to be able to have uh, that sort of open exploratory gameplay for a lot of players. Um, you know, the style of game that they want to play, for example, uh, like having a Grand Theft Auto style game where you have these large cities. Uh, and these big open areas, the way that this engine is able to provide all of these different, um, you know, opportunities, I, I definitely would love to see that in the near future. And I think it's going to be possible soon. From Pooba the Grand, uh, I'll be getting Half-Life Alex soon. When I get the game, how will I use the Source 2 engine? So do you have, uh, in other words, like any specific uh, maybe channels or places where people who are interested in that, as they mentioned, are getting Half-Life Alex to get more into the Hammer 2 and Source engine, uh, Source 2 engine itself. 
do you know where they could go or at least where they could get started? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to throw myself out there since I've created a, a, a tutorial series about 50 videos long on uh, using Half-Life Alex uh, Source 2 uh, to be able to take advantage of the hammer tools that come with the game and to learn how to design for Source 2, which will translate directly over to Sandbox and any other Source 2-based game, including apparently what uh, is supposed to be CSGO. Uh, heard through the grapevines that, yeah, that's something yeah. that's apparently <laughs> coming to fruition. So but, um, yeah, my recommendation, if you get Half-Life Alex, is uh, to uh, jump on and uh, look up the Eagle One development team crash course videos. Uh, each video is less than 10 minutes. Uh, it's designed to teach you about three different skills in each video on how to use Hammer from the basic mesh work to the more advanced creations. Uh, the series itself um, is uh, something that I'm hoping beginners can jump into and also people who are used to the, uh, you know, who are looking to transition from Hammer 1 to Hammer 2. Um, as uh, it also contains uh, a, a GitHub um, that has the example maps uh, for each tutorial posted uh, so that you can download it and see it yourself, uh, the progress between each tutorial. So uh, that would be my recommendation to quickly get into Hammer for Source 2. I, I honestly would wish that if Face Punch would at some point, if they have someone to create or at least some sort of a page where people can go and put up their own like references as like a resource for people, because people, what I've noticed at least with the community and I'm, I'm definitely all game for is people mm -hmm. that are able to put a lot more helpful content out there for people like small fish, like you, for example, with Eagle one development in terms of uh, just trying to make maps, all this sort of stuff in general. Uh, if there is like a one stop shop place to just kind of find all that stuff alongside with it, I think it would be way more beneficial and it would get a lot more people to kind of just like thrust them right into like whatever they want to choose. If it's between level design, animation, you know, et cetera, et cetera, like yeah. anything like that. I think that'd be so awesome. Yeah. If anyone can come up with a, uh, some sort of hub for that, that is like a, a central way to be able to find everything. I think there's a, a good market for that too as well. Yeah. This person asked three questions, but in terms of the, uh, the two questions that they asked were pretty much already answered. So hopefully they, um, they did mention in one of the questions, do you like the gritty and depressing aesthetic, uh, that the source, the source engine one brings and, uh, what maps have you seen that have this sort of aesthetic? Like I, I know you must have seen probably from references of other maps, you know, just trying to study a hammer one. Like how, how do you feel when it comes to these, you know, unsettling sort of feelings that people always get with that, uh, those maps i think um it's 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 maybe because i come from a a, a half-life alex which um does an amazing job of giving you that gritty rundown um type of environment um i feel like it i, I feel like it's almost overdone to an extent um from what i've seen because uh, I, I think primarily, though, it is also when people get into Hammer 2, the um, assets that they have available from Half-Life Alex tend to be that Eastern European rundown, you know, dystopian style, um, which can, um, I don't know if depressing is the right word to call it, but it can definitely give you a, a, a type of um of emotion that um isn't you know the brightest sunniest day out there you're not so what end up, what ends up happening and um th this engine looks so good with that type of environment um that it, it is almost um i i think it's like a, a double-edged sword for a lot of people they can jump into hammer 2 and right away they can make environments if they're using half-life alex and uh that you know what valve has uh you know designed as part of their asset packs um you know with those uh, uh tools that are available they end up making something that looks really good uh because you know you only need one light source uh, you can take a room uh you can fill it with some of the uh, models that come with it and uh, right away you're going to have uh, what looks visually appealing um but it does limit you to having that rundown gritty uh, uh, you know uh, type of aesthetic that um, a lot of people cling on to um, and uh, I think it's more prevalent in the Alex community than the Sandbox, because in Sandbox, I've almost seen it go in the opposite direction. And I feel like Face Punch kind of made that a statement when they went with their Terry uh, that has a very cartoonic, uh, very artistic approach as a way to really showcase that, hey, this engine isn't just about creating you know the 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 rundown dystopian industrial type maps that you've seen with alex uh, but it can be something that you use to create pretty much anything that you can come up with 
Um, so, yeah, I, I, I do agree that for a lot of people that uh, sort of uh, appeal is uh, enticing because of the assets that are available. Um, and, you know, I, I will admit as someone who has uh, seen, you know, what Half-Life Alex has to offer and what Hammer won when they have, um, you know, they had all the original uh, assets that Half-Life provided you with. Um, those can definitely push people in a certain aesthetic direction on how Source should look because you always hear people say, oh, this feels like a Source game. It's, it's like a very common phrase. Oh, I, I'd say this. You, you can tell this is a source uh, uh, map yeah. uh, based on some of some of those yeah, stereotypes that pop up. Um, but I'm hoping that with what Face Punch is, is showcasing here, uh, that people try to go ahead and push the engine a bunch of different directions and not just stick to that one aesthetic. I, I mentioned it before as well too that Face Punch is like pretty much the only other uh, third party developer outside of Valve themselves that has access to it, so they could go into any direction they really want to. And the fact that they were just like. Let's just go wherever we want to go and just see where the engine actually we can push it to allows it to be a lot more like, oh, like I did not know this because even then certain times it feels like certain games that I played, especially that were made by Face Bunch or just like any other person within the sandbox community. It does. It just completely feels like a, a different game engine and you would not think it was made in source, uh, which is amazing in my opinion. I know for so um, Gary had actually mentioned um, he was. Um considering uh licensing the half-life alex assets as part of the sandbox release that you could use them to build it he decided against it ultimately for two reasons and the reasons that he posted uh number one was what we discussed where he didn't want people to feel like this is what sandbox should look like these are the assets that came with it this is what you should so that was number one and number two is that valve wanted i think another 10 percent of all his sales as part of their royalty fees for using their assets and so oh, wow. I, so yeah he i think he was saying that they already take 30 percent, so that would be a 40 percent cut for them and he would say that he's not willing to do that so wow. um <laughs> so i think I think, I think it ends up actually being a blessing and this was uh, this was actually a topic that was ex that was discussed quite a bit over the first year um people from both sides saying you should put the alex assets in people saying on the other side that you shouldn't um you know they're developing their own core set of assets i know that face punch has hired people so that when they release it that people can just right off the bat use what comes with them um, but temporarily they've been putting in the rust assets as sort of placeholders uh so that we can at least have something to use i am glad ultimately though that you know they decided to not uh, take on the Half-Life Alex assets um, as uh, I think that's going to allow for a lot more, um, you know, artistic expression and creativity. And 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 it's funny because Valve actually purchased some of those assets from um, uh, uh, producers like Decagon. So you can you can buy the Alex assets uh, by going to Decagon and they'll sell them. They're like a hundred dollars for some of these assets. But you'll you'll when you look through the catalog, you'll notice Alex actually contains a lot of them too. Wow. Actually, I never knew that. That's very interesting. Another question from Jack Attack. How big would the learning curve be for someone going into it, either uh, with no Hammer experience or in general map designing experience? The way that Hammer 2 allows you to put something down, put a light down, put a player start down and click play makes it easy for anybody to jump into. And and I, I really hope that... Um, what people are able to do within the first few minutes of Hammer is realize how it's an engine that allows you to immediately see what it is that you've designed um, without having to sit there and wait and, and, and do any guesswork. The uh, the build map uh, ability for it to, within 30 seconds, for example, con construct your map so you can jump into it and you're playing live. Um, that's a very appealing way to get beginners to jump into it without feeling frustrated. Um, and, I, and I feel like that's um, something that can really overwhelm a lot of people coming in uh, when they open up, for example, the Unreal uh, 4, Unreal 5 editor. Um, it, it, it can seem somewhat daunting. It can seem somewhat overwhelming. Um, and I believe that what Hammer uh, has to offer in terms of its simplicity, yet it's uh, um, not just a simple interface, but it has a deep range of complexity. Uh, that to me, I think, is what appeals to people who are jumping in. So the learning curve, I, I truly believe that um, within 15 minutes of opening Hammer, if uh, they're um, if if they're following along with the tutorial, or even if they're messing around on their own, uh, they're going to start to see how easy it is to get hooked. 
And what really makes it appealing too is that you know you're not just designing a game for a first-person shooter. Um, you can design a game uh, for a top-down game. Um, you can design a, a map for any of these other game types, and you can immediately test it within that game type. Um, and that's also very appealing for people as well. So I, I believe that the curving, uh, sorry, the learning curve in terms of how difficult it is is ex- is probably as low as any engine is going to offer you. Um, it's definitely easier than Unity. I know U- Unity is level design is an absolute nightmare to try and pick up um so, so much so that you've had to have uh people release essentially your other and your own you know they've had to release their own level design tools um to be able to map for that engine um, whereas for here it's extremely quick we have another question by a local youtuber and sandbox uh vr developer gavardos uh he mentioned and asked uh, <laughs> can you pour all of half-life alex and put it into one big map with no loading screens or what about a gta 5 map oh gavardos oh uh, he's he he, I, he knows the answer to this but i love that he's asking <laughs> okay uh, as far as uh alex goes not no not into one hammer map um and um a lot of it has to do too with um uh, at a certain point you run into technical issues um and and there's two major technical issues that you're going to run into when you're building a map and how complex it can be um the first uh, technical issue is uh visibility is that it's you get to a certain point where designing a map so that you can optimize it and hide things so that the engine isn't rendering everything at once um it becomes impossible because certain things in half-life alex for example they they make you think that you know when you look into the distance that you're seeing something that's playable when in reality it's just a 3D skybox. It's all faked. So uh, that's a huge part of what limits you from having a GTA-style map, a GTA 5-style map, or porting everything from Half-Life Alex. The second limitation comes to the light maps. And what that is is when you design a map and you build it, the game will take time. It'll calculate how the lights and all the shadows are going to bounce off of all the geometry. And the bigger your map, the bigger the light map. And, and what the game does is it basically pre-renders the shadows and it builds a, a light map that it's going to go ahead and project onto the level. So what people think is you know, being rendered real-time when you see these shadows on the ground, that's already been pre-calculated. It takes a while for light maps to bake, but at a certain point, you can only fit so much light map information into the one VMAP file. So you can reach a limit where you have too many shadows, where you have too many things that are being asked to be baked, and it ends up being um, it ends up being a limiting factor. Uh, Face Punch has mentioned that they want to do multiple light maps so that one giant map can be broken down into multiple light maps that it would stitch together. That would be one way to get past this technical limit for sure. So I'm, I'm hoping that that's something that they end up following through with. So we have another question from Connie Redacted, and they put, probably not at, applicable here excuse me uh but just overall how do i get started and not hate everything i come up with (laughs) um okay i i my answer for this is scope um you you have to be realistic in your scope and so many people when they design a map they want to they don't know when they're going to start and when they're going to stop and so they just kind of start adding as they go and at a certain point you, you don't know when it is that it's going to end. And it's, I, I get it. It's, um, we call it uh, feature creep, uh, where you just keep adding and adding and adding and adding. And it can stop the release of entire maps, mods, or games. I, I mean, I've seen you know teams developing games that end up feature creeping everything so much that they never test it out. They don't know what they want. And at the end, it's kind of a big mess. Um, so my recommendation is anytime you make a map, know what you're, know you're starting and your ending point. Be like, I'm going to end it here. This is going to be where I finish it. Um, and try to have a goal for the map, uh, whatever it is that your goal is. It's got to be something that you can attain. I, I think that anyone who's designing a map and spends more than a month working on the map uh, at a certain point is going to get burned out. And it's not uncommon to be in the middle of making a map and then taking a few weeks break if it takes a long time and coming back to it and then you know having a fresh vision um, if it ends up being overscoped. So uh, the way that I see it is uh, if, if if you can do it within a month and you know what your starting and ending point is and you at one point you're just going to have to click publish at one point you're just going to have to be okay with knowing hey you know it's not perfect but i i like to put a target um you know and and, and when i'm working with the team and we're we have a goal i just tell them hey if we can get it up to 90 95 percent of what we want you know if if there's that 10 percent missing that's fine release it and then um that ability for you to see the 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 public enjoy it when you do release it even if there's some issues you can always update it later 
But that in itself, that's a type of second win that I think people who never release maps fail to experience. And I really hope that they do. Just release it, see the public perception, see the reaction. You're going to get a, a, a lot of feedback that is going to encourage you to jump in and finish what you started. So that to me, I think is huge. Now, in terms of future questions, these are just questions in general of asking how what you think of in the future of uh, mapping in sandbox. But um, where where do you think you would see the, the future of maps being created within Hammer 2 and sandbox in general kind of like going just from like your experience of, of what you've made so far? especially mm-hmm. all that in general, kind of seeing that. The community is obsessed with giant maps. Every time that I look <laughs> at somebody coming, I mean, really, every time I see someone who, who's joined, I love it because you have, uh, you know, you see the passion. I, I love the aspirations of, uh, you know, having these giant worlds that you can explore. Um, so I, I tend to see people also uh, as well giving up because they come in and they want to make the biggest thing ever. And instead of starting small, um, and, you know, being able to build up from there, they, they want to make this monster sized map that, you know, you can run around and explore in or fly a spaceship in. Um, so I, I, because of that and, and what people want, I, I, I think that the future of Sandbox is going to be based around, you know, these giant open maps that people really, really want to enjoy. Um, that will eventually be possible within the engine, um, you know, and 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 that to me is going to be something that I think is a trend that'll never stop. Uh, since uh, really pushing the limits of the engine and seeing how far can you go tends to be something that uh, it seems like the general public really really wants to embrace. So uh, that's where I see <laughs> that's where I see the trend of maps going in sandbox. Uh, and yeah, and our last future question would be, uh, what would you like to kind of see as a possibility within in terms terms of like a uh, uh, for sandbox with maps in general like what what would you like to see as a feature in other words it, it would come down to having uh, uh, tools that we can use that would allow us to create these open-ended maps these oh, bigger worlds um, and that and for example the terrain tool currently in hammer 2 is extremely frustrating to use compared to for example an unreal uh, unreal engine does a great job of allowing you to create these vast large environments uh, the display Placement tools that it comes with, and 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 being able to have the engine create these uh, larger uh, terrains is something that right now Hammer is severely lacking. And so um, I think at uh, at a certain point, you know, that is going to be inevitable with the expansion of our current boundaries, um, which I did just double check. It is 32,000 units by 32,000 by 32,000 units. So within that current restriction, I see uh, the engine receiving updated tools for the uh, terrain and being able to render terrain and open maps uh, within the engine itself as uh, something I would love to see soon. Now, in terms of where uh, people can find you or anything, do you have like any sort of social media or YouTube, whatever it might be uh, in terms of that? Uh, feel free to let me know and let others know as well, too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The uh, Our Discord server uh, for Eagle One Development Team, I'll, I'll go ahead and send out a link to you. That's um, uh, right now, I, I think from all the development groups currently working uh, within Source 2, I, I believe it's uh, you know one of the bigger, if not the biggest one, as we really try to make sure that we answer questions in our help channels uh, since it's something that, um, you know, we take pride in at, uh, within the group. We want to be able to kind of be that uh, that group that makes sure uh, whoever comes and uh, is looking for, uh, you know, how to become a better developer that they're able to leave our Discord uh, having a great interaction with the people that work in Source 2 and being able to build something amazing themselves. Uh, so that would be uh, the, uh, my first place. Uh, we do have a YouTube channel uh, for the Eagle One Development Team, which has all of our projects that we've released, all our upcoming projects, as well as um, over, I think we are at 55 tutorials uh, so far um, for when it comes for Source 2. And um, that uh, those are the two main uh, ways that, uh, um, yeah, we're... Uh, reach you can reach out to us thank you very much Chimona, for just absolutely taking out the time out of your your schedule to have this interview of course i know it's something that i've been looking forward to and i know you have been as well too and uh, hopefully especially for this interview uh we'll get a lot more people a, a bit more engaged with the idea of just trying to get into it because there's so many people i'm pretty sure that are like terrified and they're like i want to get into it but either i don't have a key or i don't have the knowledge and at least with this um people can be able to be like all right i can kind of ease my little fears a little bit away and kind of get into it more and and know that there's a place and that there's at least an answer or somewhere I can go to get a bit more help because, you know, at the end of the day, 
we all need to help each other in some sort of way. So it's, it's definitely wonderful in that regard. No, I, I agree. I mean, I'm a, I, I teach, that's my profession by day. So for me, ed, you know, being able to educate and give people like a opportunity to show us what they can do. Um, all that, that, that's what really makes me happy with where I hope the community is headed. So that, that yeah, definitely uh, hope to hope to help out anyone who reaches out and asks for it. And uh, that'll just make better games for everyone else to enjoy. But thank you so much again. I really do appreciate it very, very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the interview. Oh, hey, hey, listen, I have a couple of seconds before the video ends. If you really like what you've seen, check out my channel. And if you have a need for dopamine rush and have severe ADHD like me, I also have YouTube shorts and other stuff on my channel too. Uh, check it out. All right. Okay. Bye.